When I say the word control, what comes to mind? Probably nothing positive, right? I mean, most of us don't have all the positive vibes when we think about that word. Why? Because who wants to be controlled? Nobody. Who wants to be told what to do? Again, nobody. In fact, as teenagers, I bet you feel that more than anyone else. When you're in high school, you're basically expected to act like an adult, and at the same time, a lot of your life is still under the rules of schools and sports teams and leagues and parents and coaches and teachers and so many others. And that can be really annoying. <laughs> I think most of us would agree that we don't love the idea of being under someone else's control or being told what to do. We all want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. It's just a part of being human. But here's the thing. As much as we resist the idea of being under control, all of us are, every single one of us. We would probably never say it this way, but all of us are controlled in some way or another by our emotions, our moods, or our vibes. And if you've ever been around younger kids, you know this is especially true. I mean, take away a cookie or ask them to share their toy and you'll feel the bad vibes very quickly. But it's not just a child thing. I mean, this is a teenage thing, but it's also an adult thing too. How many times have you seen an adult let their emotions get the best of them? Probably more than a few times. And I'm guessing you can remember a situation where your own emotions got you in trouble. I mean, maybe you got into an argument with a parent and you said or did something in the middle of that argument that led to you getting grounded. <laughs> Your anger took over and you faced the consequences. Or you said some pretty terrible things about another person because jealousy took over. And you look back and you think, what was I doing? I mean, that doesn't even sound like me. Sometimes our emotions take control. And when that happens, we don't always make the best decisions. In fact, before we go any further, I want you to take a minute and think of a negative emotion that has the most control over you. What's the one emotion that when you feel it, it almost always seems to take over? What's the emotion that shows up most often, sometimes without you even realizing it? Is it anger? I would definitely say it's probably that one for me. Is it anxiety, maybe jealousy, loneliness, guilt? I mean, this list could go on and on. We all have one, I have one. But chances are, we've learned in some way or another how to monitor this emotion. We can cover it up when we need to, or we may slam the door when we're angry at home, but when a teacher makes us mad, we don't slam the door. We may let jealousy control us when it comes to an ex, but we don't do anything stalkerish about it, or at least we shouldn't. <laughs> we can monitor our feelings and emotions to a certain degree, and sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. So do you think monitoring is a solution? I mean, what if there was a better way? What if there was a solution that went beyond just monitoring? The thing that I love about Jesus is that so much of what he teaches is helpful for everyone, whether you consider yourself a Christian or not. And this topic is one of those areas. And he invites people to do something that goes way beyond monitoring emotions. The cool thing is that if what he says is true, then it has the potential to make all of us free. And isn't that what we all really want, freedom? We don't wanna be controlled by anyone or anything, including our emotions. And it seems like Jesus is offering a solution to just that. So this passage begins with Jesus and his disciples, which were like his 12 closest friends. It's found in the Gospel of Mark, which if you don't know who Mark is, that's totally okay. He was this guy who actually wrote down the first person account of one of Jesus's closest friends of what it was like to walk with, talk with, and just hang out with Jesus. And now we get to read that story in what we call the Gospel of Mark. So in that story, the Pharisees, who were known for being really religious, and the teachers of the law, which is another group of people who were also known for being religious, asked Jesus a question. Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? I know that sounds weird, but in other words, here's what they're saying. Why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? I mean, come on, sanitize, it's gross, right? But you have to understand that back then, I mean, we're talking 2000 years ago, there was very little water available. And when you did have some, you weren't thrilled at the idea of pouring it out all over your hands to clean them. But they were actually talking about something bigger than hygiene. See, the Pharisees were bothered because of what it meant religiously to not clean your hands. They were actually accusing Jesus of breaking what they would call the law of the elders, which was a law that was passed down by word of mouth through generations among 
the Jewish people. And that's important, don't forget that. But it's also important to note that there was the written law, which Moses had received much earlier from God. That included the Ten Commandments, as well as 103 other commandments. And it was really tricky, because sometimes the oral law was in conflict with the written law. The whole situation was so confusing. So if you're confused, I feel like maybe I'm a little confused right now, it's totally okay. But Jesus speaks right into what matters most. And he answers their question in sort of a genius way. Instead of just coming for them directly, like with his own comeback, he decides to quote somebody that they would have respected highly, the prophet Isaiah. Look at what he says. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And then, in case it wasn't totally clear at that point what Jesus was getting at, he sums it up this way. He says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're not trying to lead people closer to God. You're looking to make power plays that keep you in charge and keep other people under your control. And that's not the way that God works. But Jesus still isn't done. Look at what he says next. He says, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. <laughs> Meaning, the fact that the disciples didn't wash their hands doesn't make God mad at them. Big surprise there, right? See, what Jesus is saying is God is bigger and better than all of that. Back in the day, God gave people the law because he had their best interests in mind. He wasn't trying to keep himself happy by controlling and manipulating their behavior. And Jesus basically says, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? Yeah, I know it's kind of gross to think about. It's really a biology lesson that he's giving them. He's saying what goes in must, you know this, come out. But what comes out of a person's mouth? Those are the things that actually defile them. Basically, what he's saying is we aren't in conflict with God because we accidentally eat the wrong thing. We're in conflict with God when what comes out of our mouths hurts the people that God loves. And spoiler alert, God loves everyone. I mean, that was the whole theme of Jesus's teaching, that God loves you, the person beside you, in front of you, behind you, the person next to you at school, beside you in the car, in your neighborhood, and on and on and on. God loves people. In fact, you could say that everything Jesus taught really centered on that idea, how we love God by loving other people. But we're not gonna stop there. Because when Jesus talks about what puts us in conflict with God, he talks about how the source of our offensive words and deeds is inside of us. It's the emotions that we're trying to monitor and control. This is what Jesus said. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, haven't you found this to be true if you really think about it? Everything begins with just a thought. Jesus mentions murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, and folly. <laughs> and every one of those things begins with a thought. And that last word that he says, folly, that really sums it up. I mean, folly is just bad judgment. And your greatest regrets with your friends and family were probably the result of bad judgment. Anytime you look back and think, how could I have made that mistake? Why would I do such a thing? Or why would I say something like that? That's folly. And Jesus is saying, all that stuff starts in your thoughts and emotions. And he cares about what could happen as a result of it. And here's how this is connected to what we're gonna be talking about the next couple of weeks. The negative emotion that we try to monitor, the anger that we don't seem to have control over, the FOMO that gets us in trouble and causes regret, the fear that we look at and wish we could just chill out about, the guilt we're trying to hide from or, or just play off. It comes from our internal environment, our emotions. So for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna start paying more attention to the world inside of ourselves. And we're going to try to form a habit of telling ourselves that it doesn't have to control us anymore. Maybe it controlled us in the past. I mean, maybe we let it lead us toward making some mistakes or even hurting other people, but not anymore. We're going to stop giving it that type of power. Now, here's the reality. Emotions aren't always bad. 
Emotions are part of being human and they help us figure out what's right and wrong around us. But when they control us and they make us do things that we don't wanna do, when they keep us from living the full life that Jesus intends for us, then our emotions aren't helpful anymore and we have to rethink how we're handling them. To do that, I want you to remember one simple truth. Because of Jesus, emotions don't have to be the boss of you. Jesus is a way better boss than any negative emotions you feel, and he can give you the strength to stand up to that emotion that's trying to control you. The truth is, this doesn't come naturally. I mean, we live in a culture that doesn't really help us see and talk about the emotions that we have going on inside of us in a healthy way. From what we see, to where we go for advice, or even what we listen to, I know that that's been an issue for me in my life, and it might be that way for you too. We can be made to feel weak or overly sensitive for talking about our emotions. I've felt that way before, but here's the truth. It's good for all of us to learn how to name what emotions we're experiencing and then learn how to keep them from controlling us. Because when our emotions control us, we end up doing or saying things that hurt ourselves or others. This is so important and this has been so impactful in my life. So there's just two things that I'd love for you to try. First, think of the top one or two emotions that you have the hardest time controlling. I mean, these are the emotions that control you more than you'd like. Maybe it's anger, fear, insecurity, jealousy, greed, anxiety, or, or something else. What is the one emotion that no matter how hard you try, it just keeps showing up? And then second, start checking in with yourself. This week, I want you to begin asking yourself at the end of each day, how am I really doing? This is a game changer. As you look back on the day, I want you to pay attention to the emotions that were a big part of it. Don't ignore them. Give them thought, focus, energy, and attention. I mean, were they positive or negative? If there were some negative ones, are you still holding on to them at the end of the day? Or what caused you to feel those negative emotions? And is there something you need to do or talk to somebody about regarding that? I mean, was it a person or a situation? Pay attention to the emotions you're holding on to. Are you mad at someone? Did someone say or do something that hurt you? Look, as uncomfortable as this may feel to do, there's a reason why we start here. Because the feelings we hold on to overflow into the lives of those around us. And that's a really big deal. We need to figure out what caused them and how we can handle them. We weren't made to ignore emotions and we weren't made to become numb to them. If we ignore them, they can come back stronger than ever and wind up controlling us. If we numb the negative emotions, then we wind up numbing the positive ones as well. God didn't create us to not feel. Feeling is, is good, even the difficult stuff. That's why it's important that we pay attention to what's going on inside. We just have to figure out what to do next. And if you're a Jesus follower, this is a big deal for you because emotions aren't meant to be the boss of us. Jesus was meant to be the boss of us. And he is a way better boss than our emotions. And how do I know? Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, written by one of Jesus's closest friends, he writes out the words of Jesus when he said this. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then another time, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. How good does that sound? In other words, Jesus is a way better boss than any vibe or emotion we feel. He's worth listening to when it comes to how we handle the emotions that we have. And if you follow him, you'll find this out for yourself. Because of Jesus, Emotions don't have to be the boss of you.